And so uh, I think these things all said uh, might begin to turn the electorate around. But where are you going to find someone who has the stamina to talk like that day after day, night after night, for 90 days with very little money? Someone who's young and strong, where is he? Is it Mario Cuomo, Mar uh, Warren Beatty? Who's going to do it? <laughs> you know, we need someone to come out of the, uh, someone to terrify Clinton at the least. Because Clinton is a consummate realist. And if he finds that these words are working, he will find a nice way to say the same thing. It'll be too polite for our taste, but nonetheless, uh, he will begin to affect a few people. But so long as he believes that the way to save this country is by getting his hip just as close to the Republicans as he can and keep them from occupying the center, he's going to lose and lose and lose. And if he wins, it'll be worse. Because if we ever get a depression under Clinton, it'll be almost as bad as being in a depression under Phil Graham. The key problem, the key problem is that black and white relations have deteriorated terribly. This is probably 50% the fault of whites and 50% the fault of blacks. But the fact of the matter is we are much further apart than we were 30 years ago. 30 years ago, the people in the Democratic Party felt a kind of hope that whites and blacks were coming together. They didn't have to love each other, but they could respect each other. They're getting nearer to one another. Now we're divided. And through that split, the armies of the right have marched. So it takes, it takes a recognition of how bad things will be if there's a, a depression coming. Because when a depression comes, nothing's going to hold together any longer. And if there are riots in the ghettos, as there may well be, there'll be barbed wire encampments all over the country. And following upon that, you will have a certain suppression of the press. And following upon that, you will have a de facto fascism. Now, that is the worst scenario I can name, but it's there if we have a bad depression. And I'm no expert on economics, but I know I read enough about it to assume that we have some very odd yaws in our economy now because things are just not quite uh, satisfying to economists. The, uh, let me take another question and then we'll sign some books. Uh, here, Mr. Mailer. Mr. Mailer, your uh, Ancient Evenings. What motivated you to do that book? It was a wow. I'm, I'm impressed. Well, I started with an idea that I was going to do a book. This, you know, it's worth answering this in detail because it, it, I want to show you how very often a working novelist mind works. I wanted to show off how brilliant I was. <laughs> you did a good job. So, no, no, sir, listen. I wanted to write one chapter about ancient Egypt, and one about ancient Greece, and one uh, about Rome, and then I would have gotten to the Middle Ages, and at the end of 16 or 17 chapters, I would have had a brilliant 300-page book. But instead, I never got out of ancient Egypt. And it took me 11 years. Uh, I started with an exciting idea, which is I'd always believed, after having written the Executioner's Song, that, uh, like Gary Gilmore, I believe that your soul can die uh, before you do. And so I also felt that when we die, some of us go on, some of us don't. Some of us go on to an afterlife, some of us do not. And the Egyptians believed that. And so I was fascinated with that. But it's a terribly difficult culture to acquire. And uh, the books about it are usually very dull. So it takes you twice as long to read them. So it took me 11 years to write that book, bit by bit. And that's the price of vanity. <laughs> did you find your car? I'm sorry, did I find it? Your car. Your car. Your car. So. You know, the trouble with being deaf is I heard your cock. <laughs> <laughs> I find my car. <laughs> no, sir, I didn't. Uh, I did not. You mean my double? No, sir, I didn't. <laughs> All right, I think. Uh, are you satisfied, or you want book signing, or more questions? More questions. More questions. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. You changed your style of writing over the years from book to book to book. I mean, if you could explain the importance of style and nuance, you, you talked about that quite a bit in your fiction and in your nonfiction. Style uh, is important to you. There's some of your feelings about that. Did you all hear it out there? No. no. The question is, you change your style from book to book, and you've written about how style is important in terms of what you're doing in each book, and would I care to expatiate on that a little? 
You know, there are two kinds of writers. They're the kind who uh, either are born or develop a style that's uniquely there. And most of the great writers are that way. Tolstoy had a style that was his to almost everything he wrote. And there's some of us in another rank, somewhat below that. I thought that my style, the style for which I write, in which I write most of my books, would have wrecked what I was trying to accomplish in that book. So I changed to a very simple style. Same thing happens with Oswald's Tale. That's written in a very simple style for most of it. Uh, and the reason is that certain kinds of reality can only be approached through certain kinds of style. At least that's my belief. And I learned that all proportions kept from Picasso. Because Picasso changed his style all the time, since he was always attacking the nature of reality. Picasso was obsessed with the nature of reality. And uh, therefore, he kept changing his painting style in order to see another aspect of reality. And that's what I find interesting in style, is to find that style that will uh, delineate the material you're working on. Yes, sir? Uh, Moynihan has called for the abolition of the CIA. I was wondering what you felt about that. Well, as a novelist, I would hate to see them go. <laughs> and after all, how much of me is novelist? Maybe more than 50%. <laughs>